Hello, everybody. I'm Martha McCallum, and my book, Unknown Valor, went on sale today, and I'm very excited about it. And I'm so glad to have you with us tonight, and I'm especially thrilled to have my good friend Dana Perino with me, who's been so encouraging and has given me such great advice through this process, and I'm grateful to her for that, and I'm grateful to you staying late. It's been a long day, um, Honored. and we're going to do this um, and chat for uh, the next 30 minutes and answer your questions and sign books and, and talk and have yeah. a great time. So thanks, Dana. For well, it's here. an honor to be here because I love I love books. I know you love books. And I, I actually have one. I'm going to ask you a question about that because we bonded over something years ago that I still wonder if you have in mind. Um, but I love to read good books, too. And I love it when I get a preview. So I got to read it early on. And I was really blown away. She outdid herself with the book. Um, because I've never read a book quite like this, where you have the history of what happened marking an amazing time in American history. This is the, um, battle in the, the battles in the Pacific during World War II, but it's interspersed with writing from a personal level, from a family perspective that pulls it all together and it felt like being taken right back into that time. And maybe we could start by asking, how did you, even think that you would want to write a book like this and tell people a little bit about what well, it's about. You know, I, I was uh, talking to the publishers at HarperCollins about some ideas. And when I started talking about this idea, I had a few ideas. When I started talking about this idea, it was just so moving to me. This story has always moved me since the first time I read Harry Gray's letters. It was just so alive to me. and. I, and as soon as I started talking about it, um, Eric Nelson at HarperCollins said, you know, that, that's your book. You can tell the passion. That's what you need so to So who write. was Harry Gray? So Harry Gray was my mother's first cousin uh, and my grandfather's nephew. But he lost his own father when he was 12 years old. And my grandfather, Frank Bose, became like a father to him. And his mother, my Aunt Anne, I was always very close to growing up. She was one of the coolest people that I knew growing up, and I loved her, and Harry was her son. And my Aunt Nancy was Harry's sister, and Aunt Nancy is the survivor of that group. And she, I started the whole process of writing the book by sitting down and doing a lengthy interview with her at her house in Clifton, New York. Uh, and I started learning things. You know, I thought I knew the story, but I started learning so much more when because I Because they're her. kind of quiet about it. Yeah, a lot of people from World War II don't talk. But my grandfather didn't mm -hmm. talk about it at all. It was like not allowed. Both of my grandfathers actually. And he was in the Pacific as well. Uh, my father's father was in the Pacific, yeah. and then uh, my mother's was in Europe. Yeah. And their romance stories are interesting too. Um, after that, uh, when they come back. Yeah. Uh, my grandfather met my grandmother on a blind date. Really. When, on the on the night he got back from the war, wow. going from San Diego to to Philly. But this is really, this That's is your amazing. story. Um, I want to hear that more of that story. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a romantic story. Um, tell me a little bit about, or tell them a little bit about um, how your grandfather charted the war for himself. I love this yeah. image. I mean, he was always very, he was an avid reader, so he was always reading and smoking his pipe in his green velvet chair in their house <laughs> uh, in Peekskill, New York. And... He was just naturally curious about everything and, of course, wanted to know what was going on with the movement of, uh, of uh, the Nazi Germany uh, Wehrmacht across Europe as that sort of... And I've seen the old newsreels where it's like black ink spills across the map as the Nazis go through Poland mm -hmm. and Denmark and across uh, Western Europe. And he had maps that he just pulled out of the newspaper and he would put them on the on his board over his workbench in the basement and put pins in them and chart it all. And uh, I found, when I was a kid, I found his his green Liberty Mutual Insurance Company, which is where he worked, scrapbook. And he had kept a lot of these maps and articles about the war. And in the back, there's a little picture of, of Junior's obituary in the back. They called him Junior mm -hmm. Harry Gray. Um, and he had written a, just a little note on the front that said the story of Iwo Jima. And I found it when I was a child. And I was like, what's Iwo Jima? And I started, you know, the pages are all so hard now. You can mm -hmm. barely open this old scrapbook. But um, it just intrigued me so much. But, and tell us the significance of this book uh, goes on, went on sale today in stores. Yeah. What's the significance of this day? It's really meaningful to me. I mean, you know, it has charted a story of my family. I think my mother um, passed away four or five years ago, almost five years ago. And um, 
she loved her cousin Harry so much. She was like a brother to her. And she always admired him. And she shared his story with us growing up. She wanted everyone to remember him and to remember his story. And so by telling his story, I think that this sort of leaves a legacy for my family. And the other thing I want to say about that is that for me, Harry Gray really is so many young yes. men. And there are so many families, I'm sure in your families, uh, just watching this, there's someone in your family history who died in a war. And I would encourage you to just do what you can to learn his or her story because it will open doors for you in your family history mm -hmm. and it will be an amazing journey. So he is very special to my family, but he also, for me, represents these young men who sacrificed everything 75 their whole years life. Ago. 75 years ago uh, in, in Iwo Jima and mm -hmm. all across the Pacific in, in World War II as we celebrate these 75th anniversaries. Mm -hmm. I also went to Normandy for the 75th anniversary to do our coverage there. And um, so this is an important moment, I think, to look back at, at the sacrifices of these you, men. And so we're going to have you start signing some okay. books because for everybody, if you're watching, of course, you bought a book and you'll be reading this book, but she's going to sign it, which is a super special. And if you ask a question, I'm going to try to get through as many as I possibly can while asking the ones that I brought with me as well. So Craig from um, McCungie, Pennsylvania, I hope I'm saying that right, Craig. He asked, what was your biggest surprise when conducting research for this book? Oh, there were a lot of surprises. Um, a whole other storyline that I haven't talked about that much today is Dominic Grassi. Mm. And he... Um, I was having dinner with some friends, family friends who I've known for a long time in Florida while I had started the research for the book. And um, my friend, Nikki uh, Grassi, Erico, said, you know, my uncle also was killed at Iwo Jima. And I said, wow, that's amazing. And so I started looking into his story and it turned out that he was an incredible hero. He received the Navy Cross for his valor at Iwo Jima. And he was a great football player in high school and college in Rochester. And he was recruited by the Giants to play professional oh. football. And he um, turned it down. He said, you know, the war will be over soon and I'll be back and then maybe I'll pick up my football career. Um, but he also was killed at Iwo Jima and he was, he was an amazing hero. He helped to clear the airfield, um, which made really the, the victory ultimately Possible. Do you know what is one of the most impressive parts of this book? Because, like, I was impressed all the way through, and then I get to the end. And no spoilers, I'm not going. But you kind of know how it ends, right? Because yeah. this is history. But when you, at the end, the most beautiful, well written wrap up of all of the lives. I loved that part. So you have to get uh, to all of I know. I, I want everyone to, if you buy the book and you read the book, I please read the epilogue because yes. it does tell you a lot about how all these stories and these lives intersect. And, it's, a, um, it's so well written. I loved it. Um, Catherine from Littleton, Colorado. Shout out hometown. Um, she says, I love that you are honoring someone in your own family and the lives of many others who served and fought. I don't believe this battle is portrayed in history this way. I think, but, but I think what she means is that we don't, we know a lot more, I think, yeah. about the war in Europe in World War II, yes. but and not as much as about the war in the Pacific. I think that's very true. Um, the, the battles in the Pacific are so, you know, obviously um, there's just tremendous sacrifice in both of these theaters, in the European theater and the Pacific theater. Um, but I, I don't, it, it may be because people are more familiar with the European Theater. They know the countries. They know France and the United Kingdom and Italy and all of the and countries the concentration that were involved. Camps too, and the I concentration think, camps, absolutely. Um, and they're more familiar with Hitler than they are with Hirohito. Yep. Um, but it is, uh, and and so many of these islands, I think, until you really study them, it seems like they all kind of blend together in the Pacific. But each island actually presented its own unique, um, brutal challenges for these. I learned warriors. so much about Hirohito. In this. He's an interesting wow. character, and it's fascinating that he outlived all of the other uh, tyrants who were involved in World War II, and he did it largely by convincing people that he was just sort of an innocent bystander and that his military ran away uh, with this mm -hmm. aggressive posture taking over all of these islands and, and beginning with China. Um, and it's really not true. He really was, was definitely pulling the puppet strings behind, uh, behind the effort. Um, Ralph from Glen Burnie, Maryland asks, do you think the younger generation will truly know what those courageous men and women went through during World War II? Well, I hope this will help them, uh, some of them to know. It all, there's also an audiobook. I know that my son is going to listen to the audiobook because he loves audiobooks. Um, 
I think we have to keep telling these stories. I think it's really important to remind them because this is one of the richest parts of our of our history and it's tremendously devastating and there's so much loss in, involved in it, but it's also just incredible tales of bravery and courage. And I think it's so important because, you know, they spend a lot of time playing video games and looking at their phones and we just really have to continue to push these um, lines of, of history in our schools and in their reading. Yeah. Um, th this is kind of, this is sweet. Joe from Clinton Township, Michigan. Okay, ready for this? He says, hello, did you go to Iwo Jima March of 2019? I did. Okay, so are you doing the 2020 special on this? End? Okay, blah, blah, yes, this indeed. He says, if so, oh. we met there on a shuttle coming back from Mount Sirabachi, and I ah. directed you and your cameraman to a pillbox near the oh, beach. Oh, Joe, that's fantastic. I'm so glad. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> um, that was just an amazing, really life-changing trip for me, and I know that I could never have written the book if I had not made that trip to Iwo Jima with Ron Drez, who's my excellent co-author and a terrific historian. Um, and uh, thank you for, for showing us that. So um, neat. That uh, Daniel um, in Columbus, Ohio asks, did Woody Williams know your uncle, Harry Gray? No, I, I don't believe so. Not that I know of. You know, there were 60,000 um, Marines on Iwo Jima, and it's eight square miles. It's a tiny island, but there were a little bit north of 60,000 American Marines there. So that's why it's so astonishing that I actually ended up meeting two of them who were with my uncle because uh, the vast majority of them, you know, did not intersect. Mm -hmm. um, David from Newport News asks, how did your parents teach you about your uncle's service and sacrifice? My mother, well, you know, when I was from a young age, she um, showed us the letters. That was the first introduction to me. She said, these are letters. And I, I bet the first time she showed them to me, I probably was like, mm, I don't really understand this, you know. But I looked at them over and over as I was growing up, and I was just, I was very moved by them. And I used to share them with my friends. I'd say, isn't this incredible? Look at these stories. There's one really heartbreaking letter, you know, that my grandfather wrote that got returned. Um, that Harry, mm, you know, didn't read, got. and that one always moved me mm -hmm. a lot. But there's also, there's some romance in this yeah. book, like a young, blossoming romance, yeah. and I love that part of the story. Yeah. Um, Harry was 15-year-old young boy in uh, Arlington, Massachusetts, and he liked to go roller skating, and he liked to go to the bowling alley with his friends on the weekends, and he met a young woman named Dorothy, and uh, she went by Dot, and they were very much in love. And I know that from his letters because, you know, he refers to her in the letters. But I also know it because now I had the honor of meeting Charlie Gubish and George Coburn, who were with Harry um, on those long nights in the foxhole. And they both said to me that, you know, he talked about her quite a bit real. and that he said he wanted to marry her when he got home. Yeah. And she was heartbroken. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That was something to recap. Yeah. This is just a quick one. It's not about the book. This is Chris in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Would you ever run for public office? Oh, I don't think so. You get that question a lot. <laughs> you probably get that question yeah. a lot, too. I have no desire. Would you ever run for no. public office? No. I'll leave that to the professionals. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, uh, yeah, we'll leave that to the I think we're right where we need to be. I think so, too. Right now. Yes. Um, I'm just looking for a couple of other ones. Has writing this book sparked a desire to further research your family's history? Is there any other part of your family's history? You know, I, I wouldn't say immediately. Um, my, my dad's side is all from Scotland, and that's, you know, something. I know you obviously have yeah. a strong connection to Scotland, Scotland. with your husband, too. Um, so I would like to know more about them. There's a branch of the family that had a hotel in Australia um, a long time ago, like Field 200 trip. years ago. So there's there's some interesting stories there, but... Um, I have an idea for another book, but it, it is not does not involve family history. But okay, um, why does Japan? This is Laura in Forest Park, Illinois. Why does Japan only allow visits one day per year to Iwo Jima? Mm, that's a good question, and um, it does seem to get shorter all the time. It's now down to about six hours. You fly in on a plane. Uh, we had two planes with veterans, historians, reporters, family members. Um, it, you know, you have to be very organized to get yourself on, on that manifest. It takes a lot of paperwork, visas, etc. cetera. Um, and they only open the island uh, on the anniversary on, in March of the battle. And they only allow people to visit one, one day a year. Those, that's their rules. And there's a small sort of military contingent that is based on the island, but um, that's about it. I mean, and there's why, really nothing there. Why? 
Um, it's not really, there's nothing there. There's no infrastructure there. Um, so there isn't really, you know, I, I think they just feel like they have to be there to sort of handle, see, handle yeah. people coming and going. You can't get there. There's not like a flight that lands in Iwo Jima right. unless there's this specially chartered plane that goes there on mm -hmm. that day. So I'm going to read, um, my husband is uh, named Peter and uh, he loves history um, and he wrote you a note. So I'm going to read it. So Peter McMahon says, what an outstanding book from the charming description of families in pre-war 1930s. To the riveting action the book captivated me, I particularly like the way you have made it so personal. One relates to the characters and the feelings of the families back home while the young men leave so gung-ho and then experience combat in a way they could never have imagined, Yes, yet they just get on with it. The battle scenes describe the terrors and hardships they endured, but without the need for overly graphic descriptions. One completely grasps the horror without the need for Stephen King-like depiction, and it captures the way ordinary people performed extraordinary feats of courage time after time. I have read many World War II books, all theaters, both fiction and nonfiction, and thoroughly enjoying it. Thank you, and well done. Thank you, Peter. That's yeah. high praise because I know Peter is... Um an avid reader also well, his dad and his, served his, in his the, amazing sense of history uh, he, his dad served in the royal air force yeah. and so they lived all over and yeah. his dad was just too young to go yeah. and actually that's an interesting part of the book harry didn't have to go he because probably, he probably he might have been you know they they thought that he would probably be drafted but he would he turned 18 um the spring of 1944 and he died you know the spring of 1945 so it mm -hmm. was getting towards the end for mm -hmm. sure but they were you know they were running out of guys so yeah. they were and he wanted to people. go he did want to go absolutely he wanted to go it's so interesting it's so interesting let's see let's we'll get another question here kathy from stockbridge georgia asks are there other it's funny <laughs> I know because you just finished and this was such an undertaking and you do have a very busy full-time yeah. job and you're a very wonderful mother and wife and sister <laughs> and daughter and friend to your friends. Uh, but Kathy asks, are there other historical events you would like to write about? Mm. Um, you know what? I would say, Kathy, that I do have one in mind that I'm thinking about, but I, I don't feel ready to talk about it quite yet, but mm. it's, you know another period it's different from this period completely but I'm I am thinking about it do I'll you like it. to read fiction or nonfiction and do you like history books like what do you I'm like really to a nonfiction reader I have read oh, so I should stop mostly. giving you all those fiction books no I do <laughs> like fiction I do like fiction and I love some of the books that you have lent me yeah. um, but I I do tend to gravitate towards real stories because I just find them yeah. to be and you, you tell know, stories so on the story exactly every night um, but I love Little Fires Everywhere. I think you gave me that one. Yes, and I just read one about Clementine Churchill. Oh, that sounds and good. It's, but it's a fictionalized account. Oh, um, I love historical oh, fiction. fiction. Okay, I'm going to give you the genre my, that I love. Let's see. All of those. I love all the British history books. I love those too. So Barbara from Tucson asks, Your obvious passion regarding the events and heroes of World War II has touched me in a most personal way. As my dad and uncle served in the Air Force and Marines, respectively, during World War II. I am an avid reader of those times and I've been to Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. I hope to go to the beaches of Normandy. Thanks for honoring mm -hmm. those heroes. Thank so you. So it's not really a question, but you have the documentary on Fox where you interview yeah. some of these heroes. Yeah, I, I hope everyone gets to see it. it. It really did turn out so well, and it's on Fox Nation now. And if you sign up and subscribe to Fox Nation, you get the book for free as part of that. So that's a great way to, to do both and to get to see that documentary. Um, and I would wholeheartedly encourage you to go to Normandy. It's an extraordinary trip. We took our kids there when they were younger, and um, it's very moving. And then I got to go back there this year for the 75th. And, and Pearl Harbor is also just an incredibly moving place to visit. The week after you went, my husband Peter went with his buddies and they did a motorcycle trip oh, wow. all the way through it. And they said that France did such a good job of they did. Ha it was amazing. accommodating people. They did. And it was amazing because, you know, at one point we were driving and Lori, you were with us when we were driving, my assistant, and um, we saw parachutes dropping from the sky. Mm -hmm. And so people were recreating the parachute jump over Normandy and just all over the sky. It was extraordinary. In the Clementine Churchill book I just yeah. read, I apparently read Winston Churchill would wake up with nightmares the two weeks before D-Day. Really? And he would have, the dream that he would have was kind of what happened. Yeah. That was pretty 
incredible. Okay, let me find out who. So there's other. Yeah, there's an interesting there. bit about Winston Churchill in the book too. Yes, indeed. Um, it's kind of the same, but maybe you could answer it in a different way. This is from Linda from. Mishawaka, Indiana. Oh, uh, I know Mishawaka. Oh, Mishawaka. Did I say it right? Mishawaka is <laughs> right near Notre Dame. Ah, okay. Yeah. She asked, what is one thing that affected you deeply in all of your travels to write this book? So, Linda, I hope that if I sign books at Notre Dame, you'll come visit me there, first of all. And second of all, a lot of things, um, you know, I, I think being on Iwo Jima, there was um, a moment when I just, by myself, kind of took off my shoes and walked down the terraces of the black sand beaches and put my feet in the water. And I tried to imagine Harry landing there, this young boy, 18 years old from Arlington, Massachusetts, landing on this you know, island in the middle of the ocean. And um, I just sort of felt his presence in some way. Mm -hmm. And that was very powerful to me. And I, I wrote about that in a separate sort of journal entry that I gave to my aunt because I knew she would love to, you know, also be there. Well, and you brought back um, mementos for people. I did. I brought back me. sand from <laughs> yeah. Iwo Jima. You know, everybody who goes there just brings empty bottles to gather sand. It's very unique sand. It's black volcanic ash, and um, it's it's a good a souvenir of, of to remember those guys. I've made you tell this story already um, earlier today on programs, but for, <clears throat> for those of you who are watching, um, your mother, who loved her cousin, uh, and cousins are so special, and aunts yeah. and uncles are very special they too. Um, it's, that's a great family relationship. Um, there's, a, there's a scene um, that I think captures how wonderful your family stuck together leading up to Pearl Harbor, and there's a scene at a restaurant. Yeah. My, my mother always told me about remembering how she heard that Pearl Harbor was bombed um, after church on that Sunday, December 7th, 1941. Uh, she was excited because her parents took them to Howard Johnson's, which is like a diner place. I don't know if you know what Howard Johnson's is, but I grew up with Howard Johnson's too. Um, great milkshakes and all that kind of thing. So she went with her mother and her father and their other good friends and a little girl that she was friends with. And they were all excited because they got these big hot cocos with whipped cream in them. And she was stirring it to cool it off. And then she remembers people sort of gasping and talking very nervously and hurriedly. And she was trying to figure out what was going on. She's just a little girl. And she heard people talking about Pearl Harbor and bomb and her mom just said, come on, grab your coat. She grabbed her hand. She said, we have to go. And um, she just remembered seeing the chocolate swirling around in her cup and being sort of whisked away and, you know, just being sad about that, but also being just so aware that something really, really bad had happened. Mm -hmm. And it stuck with her for the rest of her life, that memory. Did you, when you talked to um, the, some of the survivors who, um, yeah, I know you've had the Medal of Honor recipients mm -hmm. on, what do you think that they did? How did they sh have such resilience to come back and move on? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. And obviously all of them dealt with it differently. I think some of them um, kind of pushed it all down, like we were saying, that it's just very hard to talk about the experiences that they had. I was really struck tonight after, in the show, we showed the interview that, that we did with Woody Williams. And um, he really turned it into just a positive. He has spent his life, um, after he was done working and retired, creating monuments uh, to World War II all across the country. And he wants one in every single state. And I think pouring his energy into that really helped him. You know, he talked to me about how difficult it was as a flamethrower. One of the things that frightened the Japanese the most were the flamethrowers because it was a horrible death. It's an instant incineration. Mm -hmm. So for these people who were in the pillboxes, and they would try to aim the flamethrower right through that aperture or that opening. And you know the Japanese would try to get it cut, shut closed and get down and out of the way. Uh, and Woody Williams cleared seven pillboxes that were mm -hmm. full of Japanese enemy. So he took a lot of lives. And he said, I never imagined that I would take mm -hmm. a life in my life, you know, as a kid growing up. And they up. were such different fighters. And one new thing that you learn in here about how the Japanese fought is yeah. they would just, they they would die. They, like you, yes. they would, it was, it was considered dishonorable Absolutely. to die in battle. So yeah. they had a different yeah. mentality in fighting. I mean, it goes back to sort of the early, you know, samurai warriors, and it was revived under Hirohito as emperor. 
uh, the Bushido spirit. Uh, he wanted them to have that uh, approach that you would not embarrass, you wouldn't bring shame to your family by coming home alive. Um, there were only a handful. There were, you know, 30, 40,000 Japanese soldiers on Iwo Jima, maybe closer to 30. And only about 200 walked off the island. Mm. And on all of these islands, there were um, bonsai charges on the earlier islands where if they knew they were losing, they would just plow into the oncoming fire and um, and commit suicide. But on Iwo Jima, the... Uh, uh, Tadamichi Kurobashi, who was the general there, he told all of his men, do not go down until you've killed 10 Americans. That's what you need to accomplish mm -hmm. before you die. Um, even it, though they knew they were not going to win. I had the opportunity to read your book when um, I was also reading a, a novel called A Town Like Alice that is written by Neil Shoot, I believe his name was. He's British, and he wrote about it, this... Um, woman from Britain who had gone to Malaysia to work at the rubber tree plant and um, then the war started and they have to get evacuated but they basically they are marched around this island by the Japanese for weeks and we and months go by and along the way she meets this one Australian who offers to help her um, and she thinks he gets caught and long story short she then returns to Australia because she wants to tr make, pay tribute to this man mm -hmm. and finds out he did live Oh. And they get married. But it was so interesting to read um, a novel that was basically talking about yeah. the brutality. Oh, yeah. And how disorganized, actually, the Japanese were kind of disorganized. Yes. Very. And they didn't have a lot of communication from the top. No. Uh, no. In fact, when um, Kurobayashi arrives on Iwo Jima to take on this impossible task, which he knows is impossible, um, he doesn't even know that basically the the air power and the sea power have been decimated in the Coral Sea and at Midway. And he sort of has been kept in the dark, mm -hmm. which you could do back then because, you know, there wasn't all of the ways that we communicate today. So it was, it was not, it was understandable that he was, he was, they could keep that from him. Yeah. Um, I, I had the one more question I was going to say about one of the things that we talked about when we first got to know each other, which was that you have had um, a goal in mind of possibly having your own bookstore one day. You still have it as a little dream? Know. You know what? I, I could see you actually doing it more than me know. in a way. I'm not very organized. Um, but I, you know, I just, you know, so we have really, we're so blessed because we have such amazing experiences and we have such really busy, hectic lives, but it's full of good things. Um, but yeah, sometimes you just get that urge to be like, oh, you know, you just in open addition the store to, in the morning. In addition and to everything. the store yes. at night and go home. And, um, but it but is I'm where sure people it's harder gather. than people think to run a good bookstore and I would encourage people to go um, where can they go to find out where you're going to be on the book tour so it's on my Instagram uh, at Martha McCallum we have the schedule there and it is changing so if you saw it you might want to check an update um, which we'll put out you're busy the we're in the middle of, of an election <laughs> yeah. yeah so we had to move a couple of things around um, but it's on my Instagram and you can go to see so you can see it right there I believe premier collectibles.com slash unknown valor and get you can get additional signed copies. Yeah. Uh, as she's going to keep going. We're not going to let her leave until she signs all of these <laughs> books. So Premier Collectibles has a little game okay. called 22 Questions in Two Minutes. Okay. This is, I don't know, we're in TV. We can do this. We can do this. Where were you born? Terrytown, New York. Who would you want to play you in a movie? Oh, that's a hard one. Uh, Reese Witherspoon. Oh, I like that. That's not? a good answer. Good Why answer. not? What was your first <laughs> job? I worked in a cheese shop. Oh, I love that. It was great. What is I your, ate too much cheese, though. <laughs> what is your biggest fear? Um, falling, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, who makes you laugh the most? My husband. Dan, of course. <laughs> um, what is the one thing you need to have in your fridge at all times? Um, I would say hummus and yogurt. Okay. Not cheese. <laughs> I, there's always cheese, of course. <laughs> what is your greatest accomplishment? I think this mm. book is the hardest thing and I've also, ever done, And also, she's honestly. the best mom you've ever met. Oh, I don't know. We try. Yeah. I try. I have great kids. Yeah, but you're a good mom. All right. Who is the most interesting person you met recently? Um, I would say Charlie Gubish and mm -hmm. uh, George Coburn and Woody Williams. What a pleasure that you got. What an honor you got yeah, to no, know them. Incredible. That's amazing. Incredible. Do you know what Woody Williams one told me? I'm sorry. We're not doing it in two minutes. Woody, Willi Woody Williams told me one time. How old is he? He's, he's in near his 90s. Right? Yeah, he's, he's got to be near 100. I asked, what's your secret? And he said, you have to 
take a shot every day of apple cider vinegar with the mother. Really? And so that's the thing. You do that? With the mother? That's the thing. That's the what do you mean? It's like the way there's without the mother and with the mother that comes with the thing. I don't know. I am confused. Not, not, not the actual mom. It's like the way that you get the apples. It's like a, oh. a thing. Oh, yeah. you're going to have to explain that to me. Yeah. Um, but I think I should start doing that yes. right away. <laughs> <laughs> Am I, I right, That sounds Lori? like a very okay, good right. idea. Apple cider, everyone, because Woody knows what he's doing. What is your middle name? Bose, which is Frank Bose, um, who's my grandfather, who you read about in the book. Um, Bose is my middle name. It's also my daughter's middle name and my niece's, so we have like a whole oh, Bose that. clan. The women yeah. holding it together. All right, what is your biggest pet peeve? Because we're the last ones. Everybody had only girls, so we had to pass the name <laughs> on. What is my what? Biggest pet peeve. Mm, biggest pet peeve. Um, I I don't like it when you're driving and um, people like wait too long to make the turn. You know, I'm like Let's turn. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an impatient driver. Um, what is the last book you read? Oh, that's a good question. Because you're in the middle I of writing. I've been so busy writing that I have not um, read a lot. But I have um, the Crawdad Singh book oh, on my so night table. Good. <laughs> Excuse me. And that's what I want to read. Take that with you on your travels. <coughs> yes. I want to just get lost so, in someone else's book. So good. Everybody should read that book. Um, favorite hobby? Tennis. Ooh. We'll have to play yeah, some time. Play I'm not very good. I even went to a tennis camp recently. But we should play. <laughs> your guilty pleasure? Um, the Bachelor. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Um, I watch with my kids. No wonder you kids. could fill in on the Even five. Even like long, you know, we like my kids are in long school, distance. but we, we go, oh my gosh, can you believe she didn't get a rose? Yeah, yeah. Just, it's just funny. <laughs> Any hidden talents? Oh, not really. I wish. I mean, I'm a decent skier. Oh, that's good. <coughs> Excuse um, me. What color is your toothbrush? I think it's pink right now. And your secret snack? Um... Pop chips and the macro bar. Macro bars, yeah. yeah. I know you like that one. I do. And our, we have bulletproof. We share bulletproof bars. Yeah, we do like bulletproof bars. How do you take your coffee? Black. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, what is the last movie you saw in a theater? 1917. Oh, how what? What did you think? It was great. It was great. And also Ford versus Ferrari, which I loved. Oh, I want to see that too. Um, what is the last gift you gave? Um, I just bought something for my assistant for her birthday, but I can't say what it is because <laughs> her birthday is next week. <laughs> wow, she is organized, Lori. She is organized. It was like, we're so busy the next week. I was like, okay, I have to get it right now or it's not going to happen in time. What cause is dear to your heart? Soldier Strong is mm -hmm. uh, one of my dear to my heart uh, organizations. They help um, wounded warriors walk with the aid of great technology and biotech suits, exoskeleton suits that allow them to get up and walk because it's really important, um, even if you're a quadriplegic, uh, to be able to get up, even with the help of this machinery, and move your body and be upright is um, enormously helpful mentally and also physically. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, you've been having a lot of we're almost We're almost done. <coughs> what is the number one thing on your bucket list? So there's a lot of places I want to go. I want to go to Peru, um, and I'd like to go to China, although not at this moment. That was on my list. <laughs> yeah, we'll put that on hold. Not, not exactly there's at this moment. There's plenty of time for this bucket. Yeah, but travel, for sure. And where do you want to go that you've never been? Um, same basic category, uh, Morocco. I want to go to Morocco. Yeah. We should go to Morocco, and we should play tennis. <laughs> In Morocco. And we can re watch some books. I'll, there's a lot of World War II history around there, too. Yes, there is. Yeah, so yes. there's a lot. Africa Corps. Well, I think we're done here, okay. right? Are we done? So premiercollectibles.com slash unknown valor. You should get I, as many copies as you thank possibly you. can. And I hope you really enjoy reading the book. And I will sign all of these. And I thank you very much for tuning in. And um, I thank Dana so much for being with I me tonight. It. it was great having you. I can't imagine having done this without you. Thanks. So thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Bye. Don't watch.